Jeeves Takes Charge by P.G. Woodhouse, performed by Edward Duke. Jeeves Takes Charge, told by Bertie Wooster. Now, touching this business of old Jeeves, my valet, don't you know, how do we stand? Well, a lot of fellas think I'm much too dependent on him. My Aunt Agatha has even gone so far as to call him my keeper. <laughs> well, what I say is, why not? The man's a genius. From the collar upward, he stands alone. I gave up trying to run my own affairs within a week of his coming to me. That was about a half a dozen years ago, directly before the rather rummy business of Florence Cray, Uncle Willoughby's book, and Edwin the Boy Scout. Now, the thing really began when I got back from Easby, which is, you know, my Uncle Willoughby's house in Shropshire. I'd been spending a week or so there, as I generally did in the summer, and I'd been forced to break my visit to come back to London to get a new valet. You see, I'd found Meadows, the fella I'd taken down to Easby with me, stealing my silk socks, a thing no bloke of spirit could stick at any price, and so directly I found out he was a sock sneaker, I gave him the boot and uh, came up to London to ask the agency to dig up another specimen for my approval. They sent me Jeeves. I shall always remember the morning he came. It so happened that the night before I'd been present at a rather cheery little supper party, <laughs> and I was feeling pretty rocky. On top of this, I was trying to read a book Florence Cray had given me. Now, she had been one of the house party at Easby, and two or three days before I left, we'd got engaged. Well, as I was due back near the end of the week, I knew she'd have expected me to have finished this book by then. You see, she was particularly keen on boosting me up near her own plane of intellect. She was a girl with a wonderful profile, but steeped to the gills in serious purpose. I can't give you a better idea of the way things stood that by telling you this book she'd given me to read was called Types of Ethical Theory, and that when I opened it at random I struck a page beginning... The postulate or common understanding is certainly coextensive in the obligation it carries with which common language is an organism of which it is an effort to subserve. <laughs> it's all perfectly true, no doubt, but not the sort of thing to spring on a lad with a morning head. I was doing my best to skim through this bright little volume when the bell rang. I leapt off the sofa and hurtled for the door. A kind of darkish, sort of respectful-looking Johnny stood outside, obviously my respective valet. Well, I'd have preferred an undertaker, but I told him to stagger in, and he floated noiselessly through the room, like some sort of healing zephyr. Well, that impressed me from the start, you see, because Meadows had had flat feet and used to clump. This fella didn't seem to have any feet at all. He just sort of streamed in, seemed to flicker, and wasn't there any longer. I heard him moving about in the kitchen, and presently he came back with a glass on a tray. If you would drink this, sir... It is a little preparation of my own invention, sir. It is the raw egg that gives it its nutrition, the red pepper its bite, and the Worcester sauce its color. Gentlemen have told me that they have found it extremely invigorating after a late evening. <laughs> well, I would have clutched at anything that looked like a lifeline that morning, so I swallowed the stuff. Uh, thank you very much, I said. Um, it looks awfully good, actually. Mm, it tastes rather good. 
For a moment, it felt as if somebody had touched off a bomb inside the old bean, and that somebody was strolling down my throat with a lighted torch. <laughs> but then, suddenly, you know, everything seemed to get all right. The birds twittered in the treetops. The sun shone through the windows, and generally speaking, hope dawned once more. You're engaged, I said, as soon as I could say anything. I could see that this chap was one of the world's workers, the sort no home should be without. Um, can you start in at once, you see, because I'm due down at Easby in Shropshire the day after tomorrow. Very good, sir. My name is Jeeves, sir. Oh, he said looking past me at a picture of Florence Cray on the mantel shelf. That is an excellent likeness of the Lady Florence Cray, sir. It is two years since I last saw her ladyship. I was at one time in her father, Lord Worplestone's employment, but I tendered my resignation because I could not see eye to eye with his lordship in his desire to dine in dress trousers, a shooting jacket, and a flannel shirt. <laughs> well, he couldn't tell me anything I didn't know about the old boy's eccentricity. This Lord Worplestone was the old buster who a couple of years earlier had come down to breakfast one morning, lifted the first cover he saw, said, Eggs! Eggs! Damn all eggs! in an overwrought sort of voice, and instantly legged it for France, never to return to the bosom of the family. This mind you, being a bit of luck for the bosom of the family, because, you see, old Worplestone had the worst temper in the county. And, well, if, if there was a flaw, so to speak, in the pure joy of being engaged to Florence, it was, well, it was that she rather took after her father, and uh, one was never quite certain when she might erupt. She was a dear girl, though, oh, yes, and uh, seen sideways, most awfully good-looking. Lady Florence and I are engaged, Jeeves. Indeed, sir. You know, there was a kind of rummy something in his manner. Perfectly all right and all that, but not exactly what you call chirpy. It somehow gave me the impression that he wasn't keen on Florence. Oh, well. At this point of the proceedings, there was another ring at the front door. Jeeves shimmered out and came back with a telegram. I opened it. It read, Return immediately. Extremely urgent. Catch next train. Florence. Well, this was devilish odd. What I mean is, Florence knew I was due down at Easby the day after tomorrow, so why the hurry call? Um, Jeeves, we should be going out to Easby this afternoon. Can, 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 can you manage it? Without any difficulty, sir. May I inquire which suit you'll be wearing for the journey, sir? Well, um, this one, I suppose. Very good, sir. Again, you know, there was a kind of rummy something in his manner. I don't think he liked my suit. A rather sprightly young check I was wearing that morning to which I was a good deal attached. I pulled myself together to assert myself. Something seemed to tell me that unless I nipped this lad in the bud, he'd be starting to boss me. He had the aspect of a distinctly resolute blighter. Well, <laughs> I wasn't going to stand for any of that sort of thing. By Jove, no. You've got to keep these fellas in their place, don't you know? Um, Jeeves? Don't you like this suit? Well, uh, what don't you like about it? Well, what, what, what's wrong with it? Come on with it. Out, out with it, dash it. Well, if I might make so bold, sir, uh, a simple brown or blue with a hint of some quiet twill. Well, absolute rot. Very good, sir. Just as you say, sir. All right, then, I said. And, um... He went. <laughs> you see? Now, most of the way down in the train that afternoon, I was wondering what on earth could be up at the other end. 
I mean, Easby wasn't one of those country houses you read about in the society novels, you know, where young girls are lured on to play poker and then skinned to the bone of their jewellery and so on. No, no, no. Most of the house party I'd left consisted entirely of law-abiding birds like myself. Besides, my Uncle Willoughby was a rather shy, precise sort of old boy who liked a quiet life. He was finishing writing a history of the family or something which he'd been working on for the past year, and he didn't stir much from the library. He was rather a good instance of what they say about it being a good scheme for a fellow to sow his wild oats. Ah, I've been told, you know, that in his youth Uncle Willoughby had been a bit of a bounder. (laughs) You'd never have thought of it to look at him now. (laughs) When I got to Easby, a glance showed me that Florence was perturbed and even peeved. Her eyes had a goggly look and she appeared altogether considerably pipped. Uh, Darling, I said, and attempted, you know, the good old embrace, but she sidestepped like a bantamweight. Don't! What's the matter? Everything's the matter, Bertie. You remember telling me before you left to make myself pleasant to your uncle? Yes. You see, at that time I was more or less dependent on Uncle Willoughby and I couldn't very well marry without his approval, so I told Florence here to make an effort to fascinate the old boy. You told me it would please him particularly if I asked him to read me some of his history of the family, remember? Well, he finished writing the thing last night and read me nearly the whole of it. I have never had such a shock in my life. The book is an outrage. It is impossible. It is horrible. It is the worst thing I've ever read in my life. Oh, but dash it all, the family weren't as bad as all that. It isn't a history of the family at all. Your uncle has written his reminiscences. He calls them recollections of a long life. I began to understand. As I say, Uncle Willoughby had been a little on the Tabasco side as a young man. If half of what he's written is true, your uncle's youth must have been perfectly appalling. The moment he began to read, he plunged straight into a most scandalous story about how he and my father were thrown out of a music hall in 1887. (laughs) Why? I decline to tell you why. Well, it must have been something pretty bad. I mean, you know, it took a lot to throw them out of music halls in 1887. The book is full of stories of people one knows who are the essence of propriety today, but who seem to have behaved when they were in London in the 1880s in a manner that would have caused raised eyebrows in the brig of a whaler. There is a story in the book about Sir Stanley Gervais Gervais, which is quite ghastly in its attention to detail. It seems that Sir Stanley has the most enormous... But never mind, come here, sit down. Your uncle tells me that all negotiations are settled with Messrs. Riggs and Ballinger, the publishers, and that the manuscript goes off tomorrow for immediate publication. Well, 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 what's to be done? The manuscript must be intercepted before it reaches Riggs and Ballinger and destroyed. I sat up. I mean, you know, (laughs) this sounded rather sporting. How are you going to do it, Florence? How can I do it? Didn't I tell you the manuscript goes off tomorrow? I am going to the Murgatroyd's dance tonight and shall not be back till Monday. No, no, no. You must do it. That is why I sent for you. Me, Bertie? I shall never marry you if those recollections are published. Oh, but but, but Florence, old thing, you may look on it as a test, Bertie. If you have the courage and resource to carry this thing through, I shall take it as evidence that you're not as vapid and as shiftless as most people think you. Oh, but, 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 but Florence, suppose Uncle Willoughby catches me at it, he cut me off with a shilling. If you care more for your uncle's money than for little old me. Oh, no, 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 rather not. Very well, then, come here. Now, the parcel containing the manuscript, will, of course, be placed on the hall table to go to the village with the letters. All you have to do is to take it away and destroy it. Then your uncle will think it has been lost in the post. Now, once and for all, will you do for me this quite simple act of kindness? The way she put it gave me an idea. Why not get Edwin, her little brother, to do it? 
I mean, he was a Boy Scout, after all, and they're always willing to give a helping hand, aren't they? Besides, he was way behind in his daily acts of kindness, and it would have been a boon for the kid in a lot of ways. Um, I say, Florence, Edwin would do this sort of thing so much better than I would. Oh, yes, these Boy Scouts are up to all sorts of dodges. They creep about, don't you know, and... Um, Take cover and, and all that sort of thing. Bertie, will you or will you not do this perfectly trivial thing for me? If not, say so now and let us end this farce of pretending that you care a snap of the fingers for me. Oh, but dear old soul, I love you devotedly. Then will you or will you not? Oh, all right, all right, all right, I will. And I tottered forth into the passage outside to think things over. Oh, uh, Hello, Jeeves. I beg your pardon, sir. I was endeavouring to find you. I felt I ought to tell you that somebody has been putting brown boot polish on our black walking shoes. What? Who? Why? I could not say, sir. Can anything be done about it? Nothing, sir. Damn. Very good, sir. From breakfast on, the next day I felt like a bag snatcher at a railway station. I had to hang around waiting for the parcel to be put on the hall table, and it wasn't put. And the more I thought the thing over, the less I liked it. The chances of my pulling it off seemed to me about three to two. Well, the thought of what might happen if I didn't gave me cold shivers down the spine. It wasn't till nearly four that Uncle Willoughby toddled out of the library, put the parcel on the table and toddled back again. I bounded out from behind a suit of armour and legged it for the table. I grabbed the parcel and nipped upstairs to hide the swag. I charged into my room like a mustang and nearly stubbed my toe on young blighted Edwin, the boy scout. Hello. I'm tidying your room. It's my last Saturday's act of kindness. I'm five days behind. It was six till last night, but I polished your shoes. You probably saw them. Mr. Barclay had this room while you were away. That's why I'm tidying it for you now. This was getting perfectly rotten. I didn't want to murder the kid, and yet there didn't seem any other way of shifting him. I pressed down the mental accelerator. The old lemon throbbed fiercely. I got an idea. I say, Edwin, you see that box of cigars over there? Take them down to the smoking room for me, would you, laddie, and snip the ends off? It would save me no end of trouble. Stagger along, laddie. Well, he seemed a bit doubtful, but he staggered. I shoved the parcel into the drawer, locked it, trousered the key, and felt better. I might be a chump, but dash it, I could out-general a mere kid with a face like a ferret. I went downstairs again, and just as I was passing the smoking room door, out curveted Edwin. I'm snipping them. Oh, good show. Snip on, snip on. Yes, splendid job you're doing, Edwin. Rarely, rarely first rate. It seemed to me that if he wanted to do a real act of kindness, he would commit suicide. Now, fellows who know all about that sort of thing, detectives and so on, will tell you that the hardest thing in the world is to get rid of the body. Florence had spoken in an airy sort of way about destroying this manuscript, but yet, when one comes down to it, how the deuce can a chap destroy a great chunky mass of paper in somebody else's house in the middle of summer? I mean, I couldn't very well ask for a fire in my bedroom, could I, with a thermometer in the 80s? And yet, you know, if I didn't burn the thing, how else, how else was I going to get rid of it? <gasps> Fellows on the battlefield eat dispatches, don't they? No, no, it would have taken me a year to eat Uncle Willoughby's recollections, even with a good source. No, I'm, I'm bound to say the problem had me completely, completely baffled. I felt myself getting all on edge, and never more so than when I was alone in the smoking room with Uncle Willoughby the next day after tea, and he spoke to me. Oh, Bertie, an exceedingly disturbing thing has happened. 
As you know, I dispatched the manuscript of my book to Mrs. Riggs and Ballinger by yesterday's post. Well, it should have reached them by the first post this morning, but I telephoned them just now to make inquiries, and to my consternation, they informed me that they're not yet in receipt of my manuscript. Very rum, Uncle. Very rum. <laughs> Bertie, shall I tell you what I suspect? The suspicion will no doubt sound to you incredible, but I incline to the belief that the parcel has been stolen. Oh, I say, surely not. <laughs> well, if it hasn't, the whole thing is inexplicable. After which he brooded for a bit and registered baffledness. While I sat feeling rather like a chap he had read about in a book, who'd murdered another chap, hid the body under the dining room table, and then had to be the life and soul of a dinner party. My guilty secret got me down to such an extent that after a while I couldn't stick it any longer. I went for a stroll in the garden by way of cooling off. It was one of those still evenings you get in the summer. When you can hear a snail clear its throat a mile away. The sun was setting behind the hills and the gnats were fooling about all over the place. And ooh, everything smelt rather topping, what with the falling dew and so on. And I, I was just beginning to feel rather soothed by the peace of it all when suddenly I heard my name mentioned. It was the wretched voice of young blighted Edwin, the boy scout. He was talking to Uncle Willoughby in the library. It was the work of a moment for me to chuck away my cigarette, swear a bit, leap about ten yards, dive into a bush that stood near the open library window, and stand there with my ears flapping. I was as certain as I'd ever been of anything that all sorts of rotten things were in the offing. Was this boy about Bertie? About? in your parcel. I heard you talking to him just now, and I think he's got it. What do you mean, boy? I was discussing the disappearance with Bertram only a few moments back, and he expressed himself as perplexed by it as myself. Well, I was in his room yesterday afternoon, doing him an act of kindness, and he came in with a parcel. I could see that he tried to hide it behind his back. And then he asked me to go down to the smoking room and snip some cigars for him. And a few minutes later he came down and he wasn't carrying anything, so it must be in his room. It sounds incredible. What could possibly be his motive for perpetrating this extraordinary theft? I don't know, but I'm sure he's got the parcel. I tell you what you might do. You might say that Mr. Barclay had wired you that he left something behind. He had Bertie's room, you know, while Bertie was away. You might say that you wanted to look for it. I didn't wait to hear any more. Things were getting too hot. I sprinted up to my room and made for the drawer where I put the parcel. And then, and then, I couldn't find the key. Oh, it wasn't for the deuce of a time that I recollected that I'd shifted it to my evening trousers the night before. Now, where the dickens were my evening? Things. Oh, yes, of course, Jeeves must have taken them away to brush them. Yes, to leap at the bell and ring it was with me the work of a moment. I just rung it when there were footsteps outside and in came Uncle Willoughby. Oh, Bertie, um, I've just received a telegram from Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, oh, Barclay, yes, asking me to forward his... Um, his uh, Cigarette case, yes, which apparently he left behind. I will just take a look around. It was one of the most disgusting spectacles I'd ever seen. This white-haired old man, who should have been thinking of the hereafter, standing there lying like an actor. He began to nose about, pulling out drawer after drawer and babbling away about Barclay and his cigarette case in a way that struck me as perfectly ghastly. I just stood there, losing weight every moment. 
And then he came to the drawer I put the parcel. Oh, I shouldn't bother about that drawer if I were you, Uncle, because you see it's um it's uh it's locked and all that sort of thing. What? <laughs> Jeeves shimmered in. I fancy, sir, that you must be requiring this key. I found it in the pocket of your evening trousers. I could have massacred the man. The next moment, Uncle Willoughby had opened the drawer. I shut my eyes. No, no, there's nothing here. The drawer is empty. I'm so sorry, Bertie. I hope I've not disturbed you. I fancy Barclay must have taken his cigarette case with him after all. And he shambled off, leaving me alone and fairly confused, as you can imagine, with Jeeves. Um, uh, Jeeves? The... Um, uh, nothing. It was deuce difficult to know how to begin. Um, uh, Jeeves. So, did you, was there, have you by any chance? I removed the parcel this morning, sir. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Why? I considered it more prudent, sir. Yes, well, I think you were right there, Jeeves. I I suppose all this must seem tolerably rummy to you. Not at all, sir. I chanced to overhear you and her ladyship discussing the matter the other evening, sir. Oh, well, if that's the case, then if you were to um, freeze on that parcel until we get back to London... And then we might, so to speak, or rather you might, so to speak, uh, chuck it away somewhere. What? Uh, I'll leave it in your hands. Entirely, sir. You know, Jeeves, you're by way of being rather a topper. I endeavour to give satisfaction, sir. One in a million by Joe! Thank you, sir. Very kind of you to say so. Well, um, there, 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 that's about all then, I think. Uh, very good, sir. Now, Florence came back on Monday, and it wasn't until we were all having tea together in the hall and the crowd had dispersed a bit that we got a chance of having a word together. Well, Bertie, you've destroyed the manuscript. No, not exactly. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I haven't absolutely, Bertie. Your manner is furtive. It's all right. It's just that... And I was just going to explain how things stood when out of the library came leaping Uncle Willoughby, as braced as a two-year-old. Oh, oh, Bertram, a most remarkable thing has happened. I've just been on the phone to Mr. Riggs, you know my publisher, and he tells me that this morning he received my manuscript. Oh, 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 oh. I meant to be looking at Florence's profile at that moment. And at this juncture, she swung round and gave me a look that went right through me like a knife. Uncle Willoughby meandered back to the library, and there was a silence you could have dug bits out of with a spoon. Well, Bertie, your courage failed you. Rather than risk offending your uncle, you preferred to lose me. Perhaps you did not think I meant what I said. You were wrong. I meant every word. Our engagement is ended. I consider I've had a very lucky escape. And there was a time when, with patience, I thought you could have been moulded into something worthwhile. I see now that you are impossible. And she popped off, leaving me to pick up the pieces. When I'd collected the debris to a certain extent, I rang for Jeeves. He came in as if nothing had happened, all was ever going to happen. Jeeves! Jeeves, do you realise that parcel has arrived in London? Yes, sir. Did you send it? Yes, sir. I acted for the best, sir. I think that both you and Lady Florence overestimated the danger of people being offended to be mentioned in Sir Willoughby's recollection, sir. 
It is my experience that the normal person enjoys seeing his or her name in print, irrespective of what is said about them, sir. I have an aunt, sir, who a few years back was a martyr to swollen limbs. She tried Walkinshaw's Supreme Cream and obtained considerable relief, so much so that she sent them an unsolicited testimonial. Her pride at seeing her photograph in the daily papers in connection with descriptions of her lower limbs, which were nothing less than revolting, was so intense that it led me to the belief that publicity is what nearly everybody desires. I have an uncle, sir, on the other... I cursed his aunts and his uncles and him and the rest of his family. Jeeves! Do you realise that Lady Florence has broken off the engagement with me? Indeed, sir... You're fired! <clears throat> Very good, sir. As I'm no longer in your employment, sir, I can speak freely without appearing to take a liberty. In my opinion, you and Lady Florence were quite unsuitably matched. You would not have been happy, sir. And I think you would have found her educational methods a little trying, sir. <laughs> I've glanced at the book her ladyship gave you to read, and it is, in my opinion, quite unsuitable. You would not have enjoyed it, sir. And I have it from her ladyship's own mouth that it was her intention to start you almost immediately upon Nietzsche. You would not enjoy Nietzsche, sir, because he is fundamentally unsound. Get out! Very good, sir. When I woke the next morning, the old heart didn't seem half so broken as it had done. It was a perfectly topping day, and there was something in the way the sun came in at the window, and the row the birds were kicking up over the ivy that made me half wonder whether Jeeves wasn't right. After all, Though she had a wonderful profile, was it such a catch being engaged to Florence Cray as the casual observer might imagine? Wasn't there something in what Jeeves had said about her character? I began to realise that my ideal wife was something a whole lot more drooping and clinging and prattling and what not. Ma... I got this far in thinking the thing out when my eyes fell on this types of ethical theory. I opened it, and I give you my honest word, this is what hit me. Ideal thought corresponding to our nature is in itself phenomenal, unreal, having no predicates that held two moments together, in short, negating everything else. Well, I mean to say... What? And Nietzsche, by all accounts, a whole lot worse than that. When he came in with my morning tea, I said, Oh, good morning, Jeeves. Listen, um, I've been thinking it over. Yes, you're engaged again. Thank you, sir. Oh, and Jeeves, um, about that suit, is it, is it really such a frost? A trifle too bizarre, in my opinion, sir. Well, you know, a lot of fellas have been asking me who my tailor is. Doubtless in order to avoid him, sir. Well, he's supposed to be one of the best men in London. I am saying nothing against his moral character, sir. I hesitated a bit. I had a feeling that I was dropping into this chappie's clutches, and that if I gave in now I should be unable to call my soul my own. And yet, you know, this was obviously a cove of rare intelligence, and it would be a comfort in a lot of ways to have him doing the thinking for me. I made up my mind. All right, Jeeves, you know, give the bally thing away to somebody. Thank you, sir. I gave it to the undergardener last night. Bertie changes his mind, told by Jeeves. I am reminded by way of a story of the episode of the school for young ladies near Brighton, 
an affair which may be said to have commenced one evening when I bought Mr. Wooster his whisky and siphon, and he addressed me with such remarkable petulance. Not a little moody Mr. Wooster had been for some time, far from his usual bright self. Oh, dashy Jeeves, I wish at least you'd put it on another table for a change every night. Dash it all! You come in at exactly the same old time with the same old tray and put it on the same old table. I'm fed up, I tell you. It's the bally monotony of it all that makes it all seem so frightfully sort of bally. I confess that his words filled me with a certain apprehension. I had heard gentlemen in whose employment I have been speaking very much the same way before, and it almost invariably meant matrimony. It distressed me, therefore, to hear Mr. Wooster address me in this fashion, because it doth follow, as doth the night the day, that when the wife comes in at the front door, the valet of bachelor days goes out the back. It's not your fault, of course. I'm not blaming you, Jeeves, but I mean to say you really must acknowledge. I, I mean to say, I, I've been thinking pretty deeply these last few days, Jeeves, and, um, yes, I have, and... Thank you. And I've, um, I've come to the conclusion that mine, mine is an empty life. I'm, I'm lonely, Jeeves. You have a great many friends, sir. Oh, what's the good of friends? Marcus Aurelius says that a friend may well be reckoned to be the masterpiece of nature, sir. Well, you can tell Marcus Aurelius from me next time you see him that he's an ass. Very good, sir. Now, geez, have you seen that play called, um, oh, I forget its dash name. You know it. It's the one that's on at the, um, it's the one that's on at the what you call it. Yes. Ha ha have you seen it? No, sir. Well, I did. I went last night. Now, the hero is a chappy who's buzzing along quite merry and bright, and suddenly this kid turns up and says she's his daughter left over from Act One. Well, it's absolutely the first he's heard of it, but he says, all right then, if that's the way you feel, and uh, he takes the kid, and they go off together into the outside world. Now... What I'm driving at, Jeeves, is that I envied that chappy. Most awfully jolly-looking girl, you know, clinging to him trustingly and what not. Something, something to look after, if you know what I mean. Jeeves, I wish I had a daughter. I just wonder what the procedure is. Marriage is, I believe, considered a preliminary step, sir. No, 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 about adopting kids. You can adopt kids, you know, geez. What I want to know is how, how do you start about it? The process is highly complicated and laborious, sir. Uh, um, it would cut in to your spare time. Hmm. Well, I tell you what I could do then. My sister is coming over from India next week with her three little girls. I'll give up the flat and take a house and have them all to live with me. Oh, by Jove, Jeeves, yes, that's rather a scheme, what? Prattle of childish voices, eh? Little feet pattering hither and thither. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you'll pardon my saying so, sir, I don't think you're quite yourself after your recent birth. Out of influenza. What you need is a few days by the sea. Uh, Brighton is very handy, sir, and the shrimping most efficacious. Shrimping, eh, Jeeves? Gosh, that sounds like riotous fun. Well, you might shove a few things into a suitcase and drive me down there tomorrow, and then when we get back, I'll be in the pink and ready to tackle this pattering feet wheeze. Oh, yes! Well... It was a respite, and I welcomed it. But I began to see that a crisis had arisen which would require the most adroit handling. Rarely had I seen Mr. Wooster more set on a thing. Indeed, I could recall no such exhibition of determination on his part since he had insisted against my frank disapproval on wearing purple socks. I had, however, coped successfully with that outbreak. Employers are like horses. They require managing. For myself, I found our stay at Brighton highly enjoyable and should have been willing to extend it, but Mr. Wooster, still restless, wearied of the place and on the third afternoon instructed me to pack up and bring the car round to the hotel. 
We started out along the London road at about five in the afternoon on a fine summer's evening, and had been travelling for perhaps some two miles when we perceived in the road ahead of us a young lady gesticulating with no little animation. I applied the brake and brought the vehicle to a standstill. Hello, hello, hello. Um, do you want a lift? Oh, I say, could you? There's a turning to the left about a mile further on. If you drop me off there, I'll walk the rest of the way. Oh, I say, thanks awfully. You see, I've got this nail in my shoe. She climbed in in between us, a red-haired young person with a snub nose and an extremely large grin. Her age, I should imagine, would be about twelve. Oh, there's going to be the most frightful row at my school when we get back. Miss Tomlinson, that's our headmistress, is going to be perfectly furious. You see, today is a half holiday, and I sneaked away to Brighton to put pennies in the slot machines, and I thought I could get back in time so that nobody would notice that I'd gone, but then I got this nail in my shoe, and now there's going to be the most frightful row. <laughs> oh, well, it can't be helped, she said with a philosophy which I confess I admired. Her sad case... "'touched Mr. Wooster deeply. "'Oh, I say, Jeeves, this is rather rotten. "'Don't you think something could be done?' "'I fancy, sir, that the trouble is susceptible to adjustment. "'I think that if you were to inform the young lady's schoolmistress "'that you were a friend of the young lady's father "'and had been passing the school "'and had seen the young lady at the gate "'and had taken her for a drive, "'Miss Tomlinson's chagrin in these circumstances "'would no doubt be sensibly diminished "'if not altogether dispersed.' Well, you are a sportsman, observed the young person, and she proceeded to kiss me. In connection with which, I have only to say that I was sorry that she had just been devouring some sticky species of lollipop. Oh, well done, Jeeves. That's, that's a sound and fruity scheme, as usual. I say, I suppose I better know your name and all that if I'm supposed to be a friend of your father's. My name's Peggy Mannering, thanks awfully. And my father, my father's Professor Mannering, he's written a lot of books. You would be expected to know that. Author of a well-known series of philosophical treatises, sir, though, if the young lady will pardon my saying so, the professor's opinions strike me personally as somewhat empirical. Shall I drive on to the school, sir? Yes, jeez, carry on, carry on. Oh, you know, it's a dash from me, think, jeez, but I've never been inside a girl's school in my life before. <laughs> Ought to be a really interesting experience, what? I fancy that you might find it so, sir. I drove the car down the road and, directed by the young person, turned in at the gates of a house of imposing dimensions, bringing it to a halt in the yard. Mr. Wooster and the child entered, and presently, after about a quarter of an hour, a parlour-maid came out and told me to take the car round to the stables. Yes, um, of course I'll do that, miss, but before I do, would it be possible for me to have a word with Miss Tomlinson, your headmistress? Thank you very much, miss. A moment later, I was following her in to the drawing room. Uh, Miss Tomlinson? Yes, I fear I am possibly taking a liberty, madam, but I hope you'll allow me to say a few words with respect to my employer. I fancy Mr. Wooster did not tell you a great deal about himself. He told me nothing other than he's a friend of Professor Mannering. He did not inform you then, madam, that he was the Mr. Wooster. The Mr. Wooster? Bertram Wooster, madam. I will say for Mr. Wooster that mentally negligible, though he no doubt is, he has a name that suggests almost infinite possibilities. He sounds, if I may elucidate my meaning, like someone, and you would have an uneasy feeling that you were exposing your ignorance if you did not give the impression of familiarity with the name. Miss Tomlinson, as I had rather foreseen, nodded brightly. Oh, yes, of course, Bertram Wooster, how very silly of me. Of course I should have known, yes. He is an extremely detarding gentleman, madam, and would be the last to suggest it himself. But knowing him as I do, I think he would take it as a graceful compliment were you to ask him to lecture the young ladies before he leaves. He is an excellent extempore speaker. 
A very good idea. Yes, I'm very much obliged to you for suggesting it. Yes, I shall certainly ask him to speak to the girls. And should he make a pretense through modesty of not wishing, I shall insist. Thank you, madam. I am obliged. Uh, you will not mention my share in the matter. Mr. Wooster might think that I had exceeded my duties. Thank you, madam. I drove the car round to the stables, bringing it to a halt in the yard. I got out and looked at it somewhat intently. Somehow, I seemed to feel something was going to go wrong with it. One gets these presentiments. I had a highly agreeable tea in the kitchen, after which I went back to the stable yard and was just giving the car another look over when the young mannering child appeared. Oh, I see. It's a frightful wheeze, but Mr. Wooster's going to have to give a lecture to the school. We love it when there are lectures, yes. We sit and we stare at the poor dears and we try and make them dry up. Ah! Hey, we had a man last term who got hiccups. Do you, think, do you think Mr. Wooster will get hiccups? We can but hope for the best, miss. Oh, I say, it'd be such a wheeze, wouldn't it? Oh, I'd better be getting back. I want to get a front seat. Whee! And she scampered off, an engaging child full of spirits. She had hardly gone when there was an agitated noise, and round the corner came Mr. Wooster. Perturbed. Jeeves, sir. Start the car, sir. I'm off, sir. Mr. Wooster danced a few steps. Don't stand there saying, sir. I tell you, I'm off. Bally off. There's not a moment to lose. Dashy Jeeves, you know what's happened? That Tomlinson female, she's just sprung it on me that I had to give a speech to the girls. I've got to stand in front of the whole dash collection and talk. I can just see myself. Come on, Jeeves, start the car. Little speed, little speed. Impossible life here, sir. The car is out of order. Out of order. Yes, sir. Something is wrong. It is the differential gear, sir. Failing that, the exhaust. Now, I am fond of Mr. Wooster, and I confess I came very near to melting as I looked at his face. He was staring at me with a sort of dumb despair that would have touched anybody. Then I'm sunk. Oh, do you think I could sneak out and, and leg it across country, Jeeves? Impossible life here, sir. Miss Tomlinson is approaching. Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Wooster. We're all waiting for you in the large schoolroom. Oh, I say, look here. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know a bit what to talk about. Anything, anything you like, Mr. Wooster. Keep it bright. Bright and amusing. Oh, br 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 bright and amusing, right ho. But do not neglect the graver note. Remember that my girls are on the threshold of life and will be eager to hear something brave and helpful and stimulating, something that they can remember in their afterlife. But of course, Mr. Wooster, you know the sort of thing. Come, the young people are waiting. The large schoolroom was situated on the ground floor with commodious French windows, which, as the weather was clement, remained open throughout the proceedings. By positioning myself behind a pillar on the porch or veranda which adjoined the room, I was able to see and hear all. It was an experience I should have been sorry to have missed. Mr. Wooster indubitably surpassed himself. The proceedings open with a short but graceful speech of introduction from Miss Tomlinson. Girls, some of you have already met Mr. Wooster, Mr. Bertram Wooster, and you all, I hope, know him by reputation. Here, I regret to say, Mr. Wooster gave a hideous, gurgling laugh, and catching sight of Miss Tomlinson, turned a bright scarlet. He's very kindly consented to come and say a few words to you before he leaves, and you will all, I hope, give him your most earnest attention. Now, please. She directed a brightly authoritative gaze upon Mr. Wooster, who blinked, gulped once or twice, and tottered forward. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, um, ah, uh, you know. Ma. 
Then it seemed to strike him that his opening lacked the proper formal dignity. Um, uh, uh, ladies. A silvery peal of laughter from the front row stopped him again. Girls, said Miss Tomlinson. Perfect stillness descended upon all present. I fancy that she had gauged pretty correctly by this time that little in the way of a stirring address was to be expected from Mr. Wooster. Perhaps as it is getting late and he's not got very much time to spare, Mr. Wooster might just like to give you a few words of advice that you can remember in your afterlife, after which we will all sing the school song and disperse to our evening lessons. Advice? After life, had it just some brief word of counsel, Mr. Wooster? <gasps> oh, um, yes, all, all right. Well, um, I'll tell you something that's often done me a bit of good, and it's a thing not many people know about, no. Uh, my old Uncle Henry gave me the tip when I first came up to London. Never forget, me boy, he said, that if you stand outside Romano's restaurant in the Strand, you can see the clock on the wall of the law courts in Fleet Street. <laughs> now, most people who don't know don't think that this is possible because, you see, there are a couple of churches in the middle of the road and you'd think that they'd be in the way. But you can, you know, yes, and it's worth knowing, yes, you can win a lot of money betting on it with fellows who don't know. I mean, perhaps it would be better, Mr. Wooster, if you were to tell some little story. What you say is no doubt extremely interesting, but perhaps a little recherche. Oh, story, story, oh, rather, yes. Have you heard the one about the stockbroker and the chorus girl? <laughs> we will now sing the school song said Miss Tomlinson, rising like an iceberg. I did not wait for the singing of the school song. It seemed to me that Mr. Wooster would shortly be requiring the car. So I made my way back to the stable yard to be in readiness. I did not have long to wait. In a very few moments, Mr. Wooster appeared tottering. Jeez, is that dash car ready yet? Just now, sir, I've been working on it assiduously. Then for heaven's sake, let's go! But I understood that you were to address the young lady, sir. Oh, I've done that. Ma! Yes, I, 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 I've done that. It was a success, I hope, sir. Oh, yes, most extraordinarily successful. Yes, went like a breeze, but you know, no use out staying one's welcome, what? Assuredly not, sir. Ah, I fancy that is Miss Tomlinson coming to offer you her congratulations. Jeeves, start the car, get going and keep going. Very good, sir. Perhaps it might be a good idea, sir, if while I'm driving in the school grounds I should drive carefully, I might run over one of the young ladies. Lady, sir. Well, what's the objection to that? When I bought Mr. Wooster his whiskey and siphon one night, about a week later, he said, Jeeves, this is dash jolly. Jolly, cosy and pleasant. I mean, me looking at the clock, wondering whether you're going to be on time with the good old drinks and you coming in exactly on time never a minute late and shoving the tray down and then biffing off and the next night coming in and shoving it down and then biffing off and the next night it gives a chap a sort of safe restful feeling soothing that's the word soothing yes sir Oh, by the way, sir, have you succeeded in finding a suitable house yet, sir? House? What, 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 what house? Well, I understood that it was your intention to give up the flat and to take a house of sufficient size to enable you to have your sister and her three young ladies to stay with you, sir. No, Jeeves. That's off. Absolutely and totally off. Very... Good, sir. Thank you, sir. A little more whiskey, sir.
You have just heard one of many books to go, produced and distributed by Buckingham Classics and recorded at Sound Ideas. For a complete title catalog, please write to Buckingham Classics, Post Office Box 597-441, Chicago, Illinois, 60659.